about being completely impoverished? What if it was about, what if the goal of our economic policy was ensuring the sustainability of the planet and communities, whether they're indigenous communities or lots of other kinds of communities that are at this point have their livelihoods completely endangered by climate change? Well, again, I would argue, coming back to my comments before, right now we have a code, and that code is, that's not realistic, right? And, but that, what, what feminist foreign policy or feminist analysis should do, it should enable us to say, oh, well tell me why what you're doing is more realistic <laughs> under what set of criteria and standards. Lay it out. Don't just say the word and brush me aside. Actually, work it through, and let's compare. Getting back to comparisons. Very helpful. <laughs> Anybody have something you'd like to add? You look like you do. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of thoughts on this. Um, I think as it is enacted by states right now, feminist foreign policy is about women and girls. Like, all of our work is yes. that women and girls smushed into one word. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I think the, this is one of the reasons why I thought it was important to have some sort of like civil society presence with CFFP is to push for a broader understanding of, of what a feminist approach to foreign policy is, to not just say again, like, oh yeah, feminism is just about like providing girls education. Like, that's great, that's needed but we can't really stop there. Because um, I think that's when we start to just fall back into this cycle of like, well, feminism means this is for women, or, and I, I do think feminism is about like seeing gender on the spectrum and then like taking it so much further. So yeah, we got some work on that, I think. Really helpful. Um, and I'm so glad really I get to moderate this. I, you know, I'm closer, right? So this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. And I was very lucky in that around the same month Marissa started um, Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, she happened to be in Washington and she showed up at my then office in a job that previously was held by Mary of Plowshares um, and interviewed me about what was the early days of Nats and Girl Squad. Um, and that's how I started thinking about feminist foreign policy, um, having studied feminist economics and vocal performance at Wesleyan University, which is, you know, exactly why you can watch them. Um, and one of, one of the places I also get caught up is, particularly in DC, we have a bad habit of confusing the words foreign policy with national security and defense. There is, these are three incredibly different ideas they are wildly different on the tactical, operational, and strategic level, right? And I wonder, as someone who sits in a national security and defense you know, Venn diagram, not so much the foreign policy space, what does a feminist foreign policy mean for a national security strategy and a defense strategy? And I think your analysis and explanation of really looking at power structures and the inter intersectionality is, I'm there, I'm with you. Um, it's figuring out, okay, what does that mean? You know, it, it's, yes, it's about creating the space for conversation and for ideas to be debated and considered for what they are and not for how someone perceives them. Right? As, a, as a woman with purple hair, I know the power of perception. Um, but I wonder what does that actually look like and when fe good feminists disagree, you know, do we ice each other out? How do we, how do we move forward? So I guess the first bit first, of it in, and I'd be curious from all three of you as someone who's not a news person, um, what does a feminist foreign policy mean for a national security strategy and a defense strategy? Okay, so bookmark in it, maybe. I mean, I mean, you know, my answer to that is that it's in a certain sense the wrong question. Okay. Um, I, because my fear is the moment you say, okay, now I, I, let me just say, I know there are people this, in the second panel who disagree with, with me, which is great, so I'll just take this moment to say something different. Um, <laughs> the, that the moment that you, um, the moment that you say in almost any set of structures, but particularly 
national security and defense structures. Um, how do I bring um, either women or a feminist perspective into it? What you are doing is saying, okay, here's this thing that exists, and I'm essentially accepting the ways that it exists and figuring out how I work at the margins, hopefully one day maybe to get more toward the center. But still, the, the fundamental principles underlying our national security and defense policies are ones that I think are fundamentally wrong. And I don't just mean morally wrong, I mean incorrect. They don't work. This is not what brings security, either national security or human security. That whether you're looking at the effect of what American military <coughs> policy has done to people around the world and what kinds of enmity, enmity that has earned us, and you can then start talking about why is terrorism so appealing and all the rest of it, or whether you're talking about the, our military being the single largest polluter in the country or the biggest user of fossil fuels mm -hmm. and what that means for our planetary security. Um, or, and, or, you know, yet again, another version of this is, I think we constantly, um, out of very gendered assumptions, overestimate the effectiveness of military violence for accomplishing any goal we are actually trying to accomplish. Right. Does it bring democracy? Does it bring security? Does it prevent another country from doing something that we consider is dangerous to us? I think we constantly overestimate the efficacy of military force and undercount its costs and underestimate the effectiveness of, um, of you know, nonviolent civil resistance and so on, of nonviolent methods. And there's some research to back this up, even if you're looking at um, what's happened in civil wars. So, so I have to start someplace other, if I'm concerned about national security or human security, I, or even defending ourselves against what? Security from whom, in what way, defense against what, I've got to start there and not say what does feminism or women bring to national security policy because we'll go down a very, 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 very long road if we stay in that box as we're trying to change it. I think we have to, our job is to make what seems natural and taken for granted strange so that people can say, wait a minute, does that actually bring the results that I thought it did? Under what, or what results was that really trying to get, and is there a different one I want? We need to start at that level. So essentially, I, we spoke a little bit before the panel, um, and something I, I mentioned in that, in that question um, about the different layers of this, the intersectionality of reality, right? And some of it is this idea of, okay, what happens when good feminists disagree? But also, when we realize that we are more than one identity, right? And we, our identities are partially socially constructed. We, we impart them on ourselves and how other people perceive us, all of these things. Um, and in the examples you listed in your introduction, you talked about three very different, but also co-related, if that's a word, um, movements that you know have some real overlap, but I would imagine that Beyond the Bomb sits in a different place in each one of those conversations. Um, and if you're comfortable sharing a little bit about what you've learned from that experience and how you think that can be helpful for this conversation. Sure. Um, well, also, in, I think this dovetails really well with what I, my mental reaction to what you were saying, which is that I think we're talking about systems change, and I think we can't reinforce that enough, that we are talking about systems change. Um, and that systems change relates to the work that we're doing in this room, but it also relates to all of these other large-scale movements. So Women's March is all about systems change. The Green New Deal is a package designed to bring about systems change. 
Um, and you can, we can bicker about the degree to which it's going to do that and, and whether or not that's true, but I think that that is the tone that we're starting to see from a lot of advocacy and campaigning that's happening now, is this recognition that we can't, we can't keep changing things piece by piece. We need to start looking at the broader <coughs> system and how it is broken. Um, and I'll say about 10 years ago, I was doing some theory of change work with a number of organizations. Um, and each time we would come out of, this, of, of a theory of change workshop, we would have landed at the place where, well, really the problem here is that the system is broken. And it didn't matter what the issue was, whether it was like runoff from agricultural issues into, into the Chesapeake Bay, or it was you know, the issue of labor markets in Southeast Asia. Um, every time it came back to the system is broken. Uh, and I think that the more that we recognize that our particular issue is one symptom of a broken system that has all kinds of other organizations and movements working around it, um, until we recognize that and start to organize as if that's how we are operating um, and come at the problem together, uh, we, are, we are not going to be as successful as we could be. And we're going to continue to make incremental change, which is great to a certain extent. But then that extent ends and, and we have another battle that we have to fight. And so I think what we've learned through this work is, one, there's an appetite for it. Other organizations, other movements are starting to recognize this as well. And so you're seeing this conversation is happening with all kinds of other back themes, right? So you see similar panels, you see similar conversations. They're, they're, that movement is out there um, to be doing that collaborative work. I think you're seeing that also with the funders of this work, and that's really critical, that, that, that the intersections between social justice work and nuclear and, and policy, um, foreign policy and, and security, climate, all of those pieces, they're starting to come together. Um, so we need to be figuring out how to do that more effectively, and, I, and I, I'm encouraged, because I feel like that conversation is, is starting to happen. So we're gonna turn it over to the audience for questions, and I'm going to reserve the right of the last question. Um, so I'm not sure if we have a microphone. We do, and it is coming. Um, so when the microphone comes to you, um, if you wouldn't mind standing up and clearly and loudly into the microphone, uh, sharing your name and any affiliation you so desire. Um, so are we we're good with the mic? Great, okay. Um, right here in the front row. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry to make you come no so far. Thanks for doing this. I'm Barbara Slavin. Um, I work at the Atlantic Council. I have a program on Iran. Um, I just wanted to share an experience because it's been bothering me for days. I was at the Brookings Institution last week, and they presented their ideas on constraining Iran's nuclear and missile programs. And the reports were written by men. Um, and they, they sort of came from a perspective that the nuclear deal that was negotiated was not good enough and we had to do more and more and more to, to make sure that Iran never got nukes. And the missile part was all about uh, more restraints on Iran uh, and more weapons for the Iranian adversaries in the region. And I asked, have you ever thought about some sort of arms control discussion for the Middle East? And the man who had written this report on missiles shut me down, basically said, oh, naive, not realistic, won't happen. And that was it. And, you know, and of course you can't have, Israel won't be part of it, so why even bother? You know, remember the nuclear free zone in the Middle East and what happened to that. Is there a way that we can make this a discussion about what we really want to achieve, which is arms control, instead of ways to sell more weapons to more countries. Thank you. That's a great question. So, yeah, are you collecting questions? Yeah, I was going to do three in a row. Um, so if you have a question, great. Fourth row. Anybody on this side? Because they're awfully quiet. Hey, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I'm Anna Ashford, I work for Foreign Policy at the Cato Institute. Been out of step with some of the other people in this room, I know. Um, so I really love Laura's comments on um, how you can sort of work together